Hey everybody and welcome to this, my second of two videos on the Mamiya C3. In the first video we talked about what all of the different things on this camera were. In this video we're going to talk about what they do. First thing we're going to do is load and unload film. Now I am fresh out of 120 film, especially film I can use, I can waste a roll of to demonstrate in a camera. So I'm going to have to ask you to kind of go along with me and just pretend that um, this is working. So for those of you who are into this type of camera, you, you're probably somewhat familiar with, with 120 film, which is a type of film on a spool with a paper backing. You will need an empty spool as well. And generally when you finish a roll of film, that empty spool is here. So you pull out the stud here, twist it slightly to keep it from popping back into place, take out the spool, pull out this stud, twist it slightly to keep it from popping back into place, and drop the empty spool up here. And you can use the crank to help get the spool aligned with the drive uh, mechanism right here. Once that spool is in place, then you simply drop the stud back in, and now it's going to be held. And this little guy right here is what uh, advances the frame counter. Then what you're going to do is take your new spool of film and put it in here so that you can pull the paper out this way and read the text on the back of the paper. Once you've got your spool in, you're going to drop the stud back into place, fiddle with it a little bit if you need to to get it to lock in, and you're set. When you pull out the paper, you're going to feed the end of the paper into the spool here and start taking it up. And you want to take up that spool, that paper, onto this spool until you see some arrows. And there'll be arrows that point towards the outside of the camera. And they'll start advancing up here, and you want to advance the arrows until they line up with these red dots. And then once that happens, you just put this crank back in place. Close your film back, there we go, and then you're just going to advance the film until this gets to one. And once it gets to one, then you simply rotate that backwards and lock it and you're in good shape to start taking photos. And that's how you load film. Sorry that normally I have film to demonstrate that with, I just simply do not have any right now. So, um, after you've got your film loaded, now you can figure out what you're going to do about lenses. So let me put this lens back on here, and I'm going to go through the process of how to take lenses off and put lenses onto this camera. Okay, so let's say that you are halfway through a photo shoot, and you want to <clears throat> swap lenses. The first thing you need to do is turn this dial from lock to unlock. What this is, is this will, firstly, you heard that noise. So here's the sound of the baffle locking into place. So this is the sound of the baffle as it's locked into place when you're about to change a lens. So that lock and unlock allows you now to slide this forward. Sliding this part forward disengages this safety latch right here that holds the bar in place. With that safety latch engaged, you can push the bar down and let it spring itself forward. Now pull this all the way off to the side like that, and then the lens just lifts out. One thing you can do before you take the lens off. If you want to be 100% certain that you have done this correctly, if you look through your viewfinder and that red doodad right there is visible, that's how you know you've done it correctly. That red doodad goes away when the baffle is retracted. So that red doodad tells you that the baffle is in place and that it's safe to remove the lenses, but also that if you take a picture, you're not going to get any light reaching the film and it will be blank. 
So there are a lot of different safety precautions on this camera to make sure that you don't ruin your images when you take photos. And they all, they all reset when you put your baffle back, so you have to redo them all. There we go. So now you can see here the lens mount. It's really simple. It's not a bayonet. It's not a screw-on mount. It's more like a lens board, like, like a 4x5 would use than anything. And it's just a very simple, easy way to mount and unmount lenses. There we go. And then once you put your new lens on, you just do everything in reverse. Lock this, slide this switch back, set this to unlock, and you're ready to go and start taking photos again. All right, so the next thing we're gonna cover are the focusing scales here. Now, it, it's gonna be a little bit hard to see. Let's see if I can angle it just right. Behind the knob, there's a little black index right by my finger there. And that aligns with this lower scale right above the knob. So that's the one we're gonna talk about first. And we're gonna rack out the focus here a little bit. That focusing scale, I, I misspoke, it's not a focusing scale, it's an exposure compensation scale. And it covers four lenses, the same four lenses that are on this focusing scale here. So basically, what you need to do is, as you rack out the focus, you want to look here, above this little black index, to figure out how much, if any, exposure compensation you need. Now we'll see, we'll, we'll We'll come back to how to read this in just a second. So here are the focusing scales. 80, 65, 180, 105, and 135. That's for five different lenses. We have the 180 on right now, convenient. So the different lines here represent your focus point. So if we were to focus the camera right here, let's say, none of the lenses would be in focus at all, not realistically. The line that corresponds with the focal distance, with the, the focal length of the lens, lines up with this scale here. So if we had the 80 millimeter lens on the camera right now, and we had the camera focused right here, then the 80, mil 80 millimeter lens would be focused at seven meters or just shy of two feet. It does not have, uh, I'm sorry, seven feet or just shy of two meters. It has the feet indexes on this one. It does not have meter indexes like the RB67 does. If you had the 65 millimeter on, however, so I'll give you a second to figure out where we would be focused. If you said just a little bit further than four feet, you would be correct because the 65 millimeter line intersects the scale right here, which means you'd be focused somewhere between four and five feet. Now we have the 180 millimeter lens on, which means we don't get infinity focus until we're somewhere around in here. Anything closer to the camera body with this lens and we're not getting infinity focus. But as we rack this lens out, if we were to stop focusing right here, we would be focused at 10 feet or about three meters with this focal distance. And we know that because this orange line for 180 millimeters intersects the focusing scale at 10 feet. Interestingly, this, this scale tells us a whole lot about these lens designs, by the way. 80 millimeters and 65 are infinity focus at the same point, meaning that if the 80 millimeter lens is a standard design, the 65 millimeter is um, got a slightly longer back focus than 65 millimeters. This right here is about, see that'd be 25 millimeters? That's a little bit more than 25 millimeters right here, I'd say. Looks like it's about 35 um, from the 105 to the 80. But really interesting, the 180 millimeter has an infinity focus which is well closer than the 105, which tells us that this is a retrofocus design. Uh, I'm sorry, this tells us this is a telephoto design so the um, actual focal length is significantly shorter than the um, focus of, of the lens in terms of angle of view. Okay, 
So interesting footnotes aside, the 180 also has the longest and gentlest focusing curve, which means you can get the most precise focus with it, but you can only focus as close as four feet. Now down here at the 135 scale, if we were to focus the camera, let's say right here, the 135, that little blue line that points to six is meeting that little blue keystone right there, which tells us that if we had the 135 millimeter lens on, we would be focused at about six feet, which isn't meaningfully different than with the 180. That's just a footnote. Okay, all of that is well and good. Now we have this messy, confusing little scale down here to work with. Oops. Let me prop this up so I can move my hands. Now, if you look on this scale, um, which is actually almost too hard for me to read, we've got 65, 80, 105, and 180 millimeters. And then next to it, we have these bars. So this here says x1, which means times one, and that's talking about your exposure. So let's say you have a handheld meter, and your meter says you want to use 1 1 25th at f5, 6. If you are focused in this area that says times one, that is correct. Now we go a little bit further, and we get to this different shaded area, and it says times 1.5. That's the amount of light you need to give it. So let's say that you're in this area with your focus and your light meter says 1 1 25th at f5 6. You need to give it half as much light again, which means setting your aperture somewhere between f5 6 and f4, about halfway in between. Well, that'll be easier to read now that it's blue. If we go further, it now says times 2. So if you were focused in here with the 80 millimeter lens, let's say you had the 80 millimeter on you were doing some extreme macro work you'd be focused out to here. You would need times to the light. So if your meter reading was 1 1 25th and f5, 6, you would either need to go to f4 or 1 60th of a second. Let's go crazy and rack this thing the whole way out. Okay. Now, that says times 4. So if you were using the 80 millimeter lens and you were at the full focus length to do some ultra macro work, you would need four times the amount of light, which is two stops. So again, 1 1 25th and f5, 6 would either be f2, 8 or 1 30th of a second. Because every time you increase the, the, the exposure by one stop, you double the light. So going up one stop doubles the light. Going up two stops quadruples the light. This isn't the number of stops you need to increase, it's the amount of light you need to add to your exposure. And for the four different lenses represented on here, that's a different amount because of the focal length and the, um, the law of inverse squares. And everything where I just said 80 millimeter, what I meant to say was 65, by the way, I was reading off the 65 millimeter scale. So, but any, at any rate, that's how you read it. And so what you do is you find the lens that you have, and then you look at your focus extension, and then you use that to calculate how much additional light you need. So if we have the 180 millimeter on right now, if we were focusing at four feet with the 180, we'd have to have one and a half times as much light to get a proper exposure with this lens because of the law of inverse squares. So this here is your focus scale. This is your exposure compensation scale. Let's take a look at the other side and see what that scale looks like. So this is basically a quick focusing scale right here on the other side. And it doesn't have nearly as much information. But if you were to focus, if you, if you had the 80 millimeter lens on right now and you focused to this point, we see one and a half. That little line is meeting the, the camera body and we know that this is in feet, so with the 80 millimeter lens, you're focused at one and a half feet. So if you have the 80 or the 65 millimeter lens, this scale is very useful for giving you a much more precise focus, uh, especially close up, than the scale on the other side. 
So whoever owned this camera before was predominantly using the, the 8065 and the 135. And we know that because they had the, the detailed scales for those. Looking at the shape of this area, you could probably put a slightly wider scale on it if you wanted to, though with the shutter release here, not that much wider. Maybe not. Um, I don't know what all accessories they had in terms of focusing scales to put on here. So that is how you read this scale. And there may be some variation because, don't quote me on this, I could be wrong, but my understanding is these scales could be swapped out for people who had different lenses and wanted to have different focusing scales with their uh, cameras. Okay, so now that we have gone over everything else with this camera, let's talk about the process of taking a photo, and then we'll talk about the process of taking a double exposure. So assuming you're using roll film, you wanna make sure that you are set here to roll. Now, if you don't actually have roll film in the camera, it's not gonna work. So for the purposes of demonstrating, I'm gonna have this set to multi or sheet because I don't have a roll of film to put in here. But if you're using this, make sure that it is set to roll film. Now, most everything of importance is gonna be done on the lenses. You'll wanna get your meter reading so you know what your settings are. And you'll wanna have your viewfinder hood popped up so that you can focus your camera. So for what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your meter reading. Okay, so I know that I need, uh, let's see, 1 2 50th of a second at F11. All right, so that's gonna be our meter reading. Next, we wanna arm the shutter. We wanna make sure that this is armed so that we can take the picture as soon as we're ready to. Rack the focus in and out until we get our focus point. Okay, that looks good. Take the picture. It's that simple. That's the process of taking a picture. And it's deceptively simple. But after you take the picture, then you want to advance the film until it stops and then put the crank back in place and you're ready to go to take your next photo. Okay, exposures are really simple. What about double exposures? Okay, so the mechanics of the double exposure starts with switching this from roll film to sheet film slash sheet film or multi-exposure. So this dial here has to be to sheet or multi for double exposures. Now, the process of taking a double exposure is really simple. Arm the shutter, take a picture, arm the shutter, take your second picture, switch back to roll film, advance. That's it, really basic. The Science behind it is a little bit different. Let's say that your proper exposure is 1 1 25th at f5.6. Okay, so if you were to take two exposures at your proper exposure and have them uh, on the same, same part of your film, then what's gonna happen is that you will have a very dense, a very thick negative that will digitize poorly with low contrast and lots of digital artifacts, or enlarge in the darkroom poorly with very large low, low contrast and a long exposure time in your enlarger. So you wanna still have a properly exposed negative when you do a double exposure. So you have to cut the amount of light in half. So if you know that 1 1 25th and F5.6 are your proper meter readings, let's say we want to adjust the aperture Give you a second and guess what the aperture is gonna to be to cut the light in half. If you guessed F8, you're correct because F8 is a one stop less light, it's a smaller opening than is F5.6. Same thing for the shutter. If you wanna cut the amount of light in half from 1 1 25th, you go to 1 2 50th. And the reason is that the shutter numbers are fractions. So the higher the number, the faster the shutter time the less light. So I tend to control double exposures when I do them with shutter speed instead of aperture because aperture affects things like your sharpness, your depth of field. I don't want those to be affected when I do a photo. So shutter speed from my shooting style is the thing that's easier to adjust. So we're gonna go to 1 250th of a second at f5.6 
we're going to take our first exposure. Now we're going to take our second one. If we're taking it right away, same settings, that's great, you can do that. If you are going to do something else and you set this aside for a couple of hours to take it, you take another meter reading and let's say that it is f5.6 and 1 15th of a second is your proper exposure. Well, now you're going to go to 1 30th because you need to cut the amount of light in half again and take your picture. So basically, when you take a double exposure, the mechanics is set this to multi exposure, get your settings, adjust them to cut the amount of light in half, take your two pictures, switch this back to roll film, advance. There we go. That is how you do a double exposure with this camera. And that's everything we had to talk about. So this was the second of my two videos about the Mamiya C3 Professional Interchangeable Lens, TLR. A really very capable, very fantastic camera. So if this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track and that I'm producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those below. I'm more than happy to uh, respond and I check my comments every couple of days. If you have suggestions or ideas for future videos, please let me know. And uh, if I have the equipment and technical know-how, I'm more than happy to make those. And one last thing. Thank you everybody for watching and I will see you in the next video manual series.